There is no animal, extant or extinct, that holds such fascination, not only for scientists, but for all of us, as the dinosaur. Almost any child can name some of the key players from the age of giant reptiles. Tyrannosaurus rex, Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, and Triceratops, and of course, Raptor, a killer popularized in the best-selling novel and film, Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs, which in Greek means terrible lizard, were named only some 155 years ago by a British anatomist, Richard Owen. Professor Owen came up with the name after uncovering some unusual fossils that fit into no known category of animal. Soon, exhibits based on dinosaur recreations sprang up in England, setting off a flurry of interest. Dinosaur mania quickly spread across the pond to the United States, fueled in part by the art of Waterhouse Hawkins, a British painter who brought the beast to life through oil and canvas. Painting, for instance, scenes of dinosaurs roaming in New Jersey long before the turnpike was built. It didn't take long before dinosaur fossils were found in the United States, in Montana, Colorado, even Connecticut. Museums soon found themselves vying to have the best collection of dinosaur skeletons. Meanwhile, the new field of paleontology evolved, seeking to piece together how these huge beasts lived and died. Fossil expeditions were now spread far afield, from Europe to Wyoming, to Mongolia. In recent years, paleontologists have spent much of their time undoing some of the original notions about dinosaurs, that they were stupid. Otherwise, the thinking went, why did they go extinct? That they were lumbering and slow, cold-blooded and dull-colored, and loners with no family structure or herd instinct. The latest controversial theory, advanced in the early 1980s, was that the dinosaurs died off through no fault of their own, but were the hapless victims of a fiery comet which smashed into Earth 65 million years ago. Now even the idea that they went extinct is being questioned. The current theory is that dinosaurs are still with us, having evolved into birds. Much of the new thinking about dinosaurs is coming from the brain of Bob Bakker. Bakker has been shaking up the crusty world of paleontology since 1968. That's the year when at the tender age of 23, he published a controversial scientific paper called The Superiority of Dinosaurs. Today, Dr. Bakker spends much of his time carefully uncovering dinosaur fossils in southeast Wyoming. This is big sky cattle country where the deer and the antelope play. It is a land that 160 million years ago was covered by ocean. It is also where, in the 1880s, in the town of Como Bluff, that Union Pacific Railway men unearthed the first bones of Brontosaurus. Bakker hangs his hat in a nearby town called Medicine Bow. There, on just about any summer evening, you find Bakker and his fellow dinosaur aficionados gathered in the local bar, talking not about cattle futures or the weather, but about the state's ancient inhabitants, dinosaurs. Not only do shoulders evolve fast in the Jurassic, but the Jurassic is a time at which tails evolve faster than any time before or since. A single tailbone will tell you what species of Diplodocus. Each morning, Dr. Bakker and the other fossil hunters gather for the drive out to the dig site. Riding with Bakker, one gets a strong feel for geological as well as paleontological history. So we're driving at about 120 million. Okay. Middle, early, early Cretaceous, Iguanodon time. And when was this underwater? How many years ago? <sighs> Most of Wyoming's history is underwater, salt water. The last major oceanic incursion was at the end of the Cretaceous, maybe 68 million. The mountains didn't start going up until about 60 million. And even when the mountains first went up, the surrounding plains were still at sea level. You don't have the high plains going up until about 25 million years ago. 
Walking over the Wyoming plains, okay. one quickly discovers that your eye and his see things differently. He sees back to a time when dinosaurs roamed the Wyoming plains. So what are these geological features? These uh, red beds represent uh, the dry seas in the Jurassic flood plain. Each one is a thick layer of mud deposited in a rainy season, then it dries out. The worms start burrowing through the mud, tree roots start going in, it churns it up, it oxidizes it. When those muds were being deposited, when the brontosaurus was walking here, this was absolutely flat. Wyoming was flat. At sea level, flat, you couldn't see a mountain. Nearest mountain is western Utah. You could shine a flashlight from here to Nevada. Nothing to stop it. And these muds were being deposited across hundreds, thousands of square miles all at once. When the rivers overflowed their banks, nothing would stop the flood. That's why we have so many oh. dinosaurs. These blankets of mud would spread across, not just Wyoming. And how about the exposed rock? Where does that date from? The very pretty pale yellow sandstone is earliest Cretaceous, the beginning of the next round of dinosaur evolution. In that layer of rock over in South Dakota, you've got Iguanodon, typical mm -hmm. Cretaceous critter. In that layer of rock in Utah, you've got Utah Raptor, the great raptor. So that's a whole different uh, dynasty of, of dinosaur organization. Each of these little sandstone ledges represents a particularly strong flood, a flood strong enough to sweep sand over the uh, flood plains. And some of these things go cover hundreds and hundreds of acres. That's where the, the flood punches through the levee and the flood waters spew out a lot of energy. And you have found these specimens just by walking around and found bones sticking. I mean, you don't have to dig to start to find them. We just found a dinosaur. What kind? Good? That's asking too much. That's dinosaur bone. See mm -hmm. the texture? It looks a little like hardwood, weathered ebony or weather oak. The fibrous texture is produced by the bone fibers. That's dinosaur bone. Not quite enough to justify digging, but that's how you find them. <laughs> if we had found uh, a pile of chips like this, here and then another one and another one, covering three or four or five feet, then you dig in, hope for more. That's a souvenir. Can't identify it, so it's appropriate souvenir. Put it in your medicine bundle. So how do you decide where to dig? Well, you gotta find more than one piece or two pieces or three pieces. You gotta find dozens and dozens of pieces, or really big pieces, that show you that under the surface, not far away, there's more, like, uh, that's a pretty good sized piece. Oh. And that's pretty fresh bone. That's the outer bone, the cortical bone. That would lie right under the skin. So that's a pretty fresh looking piece. Here's another one. A lot of pieces around here. That's why we, why we built that little cairn, the rock marker. And okay, here it is. Here's a bone that's not completely eroded out. Oh. This looks like a lower arm bone. This is just the end. This would be the wrist, this right here, and the rest of the bone is going in. So you'd start following the contours of the bone into the rock with uh, and you all. Use shovels. You Hardly ever. Use shovels, shovels to remove the sterile rock. When you're working close to a bone, use a little awl, dental tool maybe, lots of brushes, fingernails. So Bob, how did you first become interested in dinosaurs? Oh, an interesting story. It was a piece of science journalism, a brilliant piece of writing. It was a Life magazine, September 7th, I think, 1953. It had Brontosaurus on the cover and Stegosaurus, and you opened it up, and there were these fold-outs with the history of life, paintings. But it wasn't just these wonderful, monstrous animals that I was seeing. It was the story. It was the narrative. It was by Mr. Lincoln Barnett, and if he's still on the earth, he has my thanks, because the story was how dinosaurs fit into evolution, how evolution worked. It wasn't just T-Rex eating triceratops, it had a little bit about genetics and speciation and trilobites and land plants. It was great. And I sat down with this one issue, fourth grade, one issue of life for a day. At the end of that day, I announced to my startled parents, this is going to be my life's work, to study this ripping yarn, the story of life. All right, so you went to Yale. There's a great museum there. There's yeah, specimens there. Yeah. The, the original brontosaurus is at Yale. I didn't know that. The original brontosaurus, the first one ever dug. Which was found right was around here, right? Which was dug up about a mile and a quarter from where we're squatting in this very 
valley and layers of strata not far removed, the first brontosaurus. This valley, like, where does this date to? The stuff we're sitting in. We're sitting in a valley cut into a great bulge. The, the, the uh, jargon is anticline. It just means the strata are bulged up and the creek has eroded the center of the bulge. And by luck, it's exposed the best middle Mesozoic, the middle of the age of dinosaurs anywhere in the world. This is the best. So how many years ago is that? The first Brontosaurus was walking around maybe 150 million years. The very last Brontosaurus species, and the family has a complicated history, is maybe 142 million years. So we're looking at 8 million years of dinosaur history, what I call the golden age of giants, when there were more gigantic dinosaurs, plant eaters, mm -hmm. than ever before since. Hmm. So this first specimen of a brontosaurus was dug up about 1878? Yeah. Okay. And then when you went to college, what do we think they were like? I mean, I remember that they were presented as the, these dim-witted creatures yes. that were so big that they couldn't even go up on land, that they needed to be in yeah. water to support themselves. Well, if you look at that Life magazine from 53, although it's beautifully written, and the paintings are gorgeous, Brontosaurus is shown up to its armpits in a fetid swamp with a rather dull expression on its face. And you get the impression these Jurassic behemoths could barely survive. And the only reason they made it was this hothouse environment of deep organic sludge. Um, and it turns out, my first bit of research as an undergrad at Yale was to attack that. And it turned out that was 100%, 180 degrees wrong. It was totally upside down. The end of the Jurassic wasn't a time, and here in, in mm -hmm. Wyoming, wasn't a time of swamps or big lakes. It was a time of huge featureless floodplains that were dry eight or mm -hmm. nine or 10 months of the year, where the lakes were few and far between, where the, uh, there was no lush vegetation except in the rainy season. It's more like the East African Rift Valley today than the Amazon. Hmm. So the first clue was looking at the climate and just seeing there wasn't enough water around for them to be critters in the water. Yeah, we, I, I did two things at once. First of all, I looked at the legs, uh, Brontosaurus legs. It's got thick legs, but the paws are very compact. Hmm. They're not great big spreading swamp walking paws. If you look at a Brontosaur uh, hind foot, it looks a lot like an African elephant hind foot. It's compact with a big cushion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's for relatively hard ground. If you look at a hippo foot, it has great big spreading toes, four of them, that spread the weight out over the swamp. So when I measured the size of the foot, the size of the dinosaur, it didn't come out hippo, it came out elephant, hmm. dry ground walker. How did the brontosaurus and other dinosaurs move? I mean, in my youth, in your youth, we were taught that they were plodding yeah. and could barely get around. Yeah, I was taught that. All the, all the books I had from the school library showed brontosaurus just shuffling, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle through the swamps, shuffle, smush, shuffle, smush. We've got brontosaur footprints now from this valley, the first ever found in Wyoming. We have a herd of brontosaurs that walked across a dry lake bed. The fact that it's a herd is fascinating. There were big brontosaurs, baby brontosaurs, all in a tightly compact mass. So they moved socially. So they were social creatures. They were, they were the most social of all dinosaurs. Hmm. You never find a baby brontosaurus skeleton by itself. You never find a baby set of footprints by itself. They're surrounded by adult bones. They're surrounded by adult footprints. A lot of the herds we find in, in footprint slabs are 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 individuals. Mm. They were the most social dinosaurs. And there's a simple uh, equation you can use to calculate how fast a dinosaur was going. Based on how far On the footprints, yeah. All you have to know is the stride, How, what was the distance between a foot planting down and the next one hmm. and how tall the dinosaur was. It's a, it's a simple equation, pendulum theory. These herds were moving at about uh, two miles an hour, two and a half. That's a good cruising speed. If you watch elephants today, mm -hmm. that's about an elephant cruising speed. The whole herd's moving to 2.5 miles an hour continuously Right on the move. So if, if one of these guys sprinted, how fast do you think? That's the other interesting thing. If you go to Africa with your stopwatch and watch animals just cruising, and then you chase them in your Land Rover so they go as fast as they can, top speed's usually about 10 times cruising speed, roughly. So a, um, a rhinoceros, a white rhino, I've been chased by them. Uh, they'll cruise at about three, but they can gallop at 30, 30 miles an hour. An elephant cruises at around two, 
An angry elephant can charge at 20. Okay, we have these herds of brontosaurs moving at 2.2 miles an hour. Well, that's just cruising. If they were angry or frightened, that whole herd would be charging at 20 miles an hour. 40 dinosaurs weighing an average of 20 tons. Be hundreds of tons coming at you. The kinetic energy is awesome. And what would be the fastest moving dinosaurs? We have here in the Wyoming Jurassic an animal called Salurus, a medium-sized carnivore, roughly wolf size, maybe 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's got extremely long shin bones and exceptionally long ankle bones, which usually indicate a fast mm. sprinter. If you compare Salurus to modern ground-running birds or coyotes or wolves, you're getting speeds in the 40 and 50 mile per hour range in a sprint. So a lot of these long shin dinosaurs were very close to the, reaching close to the fastest speed you can find an antelope today or wolves today or coyotes today. Which would be? Over 40. Over 40. Over 40 in a sprint. Yeah. So what was the first paper you published on dinosaurs? My very first scientific paper published when I was an undergrad, was published in Nature magazine, and was about Brontosaurus, about the size of its feet, about the size of its legs, about the evidence for environment, and that was the first scientific paper written, gosh, since 1903 that argued these were basically active land animals, active hmm. land animals. It was a cover story in Nature, it surprised the heck out of me, there was a picture of a brontosaur on the cover. And, I wrote a couple others after that, and I've got to admit, Brontosaurus is still my favorite plant-eating dinosaur. When you wrote this paper and presented them as, you know, much more active animals than we were taught to believe, how did your colleagues react to this? Gosh, um, what I heard was a lot of what's called academic snorting, <laughs> which, which is related to academic harumphing which is you hear, rump from dies only an undergraduate, not from this idea will go away if we ignore it. Rump, harumph. Um, particularly some of the older curators at the New York Museum, actually. Uh, but I notice now that if you pick up a kid's book that has brontosaurus on it, nine times out of 10, that bronto was shown walking on dry ground. Mm -hmm. We call that the golden book rule. If your research gets into the golden book of dinosaurs, then it's accepted, then it's accepted. Then it's, it's a golden book rule. Now, what about the idea that, I mean, back then we were taught that they were reptiles, mm. which meant they were cold-blooded, you know, it went along with the whole idea that they were sluggish. When did you first think that they might be warm-blooded? I remember the exact moment. I was uh, an undergrad, I was a junior at Yale, and I was standing in the Brontosaur Hall at night, and there was a skylight, so there was some light filtering down. Mm -hmm. And if you've never seen a brontosaurus skeleton outlined, outlined in moonlight, you've missed something. It really is beautiful architecture. I was staring at it and I was thinking, I am told that these animals are cold-blooded. But they were very successful for a long time. I know that there were little warm-blooded mammals at the very same time. Little furballs, the ancestors of us humans and Labrador retrievers. And cold-blooded basically means you just don't have an internal source of heat. Cold-blooded is a funny term. Um, if you want to use it precisely, Cold-blooded is what a lizard does, which means if you want to heat up your body, you bask in the sun, you sit on a rock under the sun, or you find a rock that's already heated by the sun, and your heart's small, and your lungs are small, so you may be able to sprint for a few seconds, but you poop out really quickly. So cold-blooded is being dependent upon the sun, directly or indirectly, and only be able, only be able to uh, run out and chase stuff for very short periods during the time. Being hot-blooded, best definition is what a roadrunner does, what a coyote does, what a horse does, which is you produce a lot of body heat all the time and you have a big heart and you have big lungs, so... That so gives you endurance. You, you have great endurance, time. you can be out there running and walking for 10 minutes, for an hour, for two hours at a time. I assume it also means that you can live in colder climates. Absolutely, range can yeah. be greater. So you're looking at this brontosaur, right. the light's coming in. Right. And cold light is coming in. And I'm thinking the standard story is all of these dinosaurs who ruled the earth for 160 million years were strictly cold-blooded, just big lizards. And yet at the same time, warm-blooded mammals existed. Animals close in physiology to you or me or to giraffes and coyotes and horses, they existed. Warm-blooded mammals and dinosaurs started at about the same time, 220 million years ago. And yet, 
The mammals stayed very small, and the dinosaurs evolved immense sizes. That makes no sense at all. Hmm. Warm-bloodedness, supposedly, is better than cold-bloodedness if you want to evolve large size. Go to a zoo today. Who are the big animals? Right. Hippos, rhinos, elephants, giraffes, buffalo, uh, lions, tigers, bears, uh, ostriches, cassowaries, big hot-blooded. How many big cold-blooded animals do you see in the zoo? Hardly any, maybe a giant tortoise. So here's an ecological rule which struck me in 1966. If you want to be big and successful, you've got to be hot-blooded. You have to be, that's the rule. If you want to be small, you can be cold-blooded. 8,000 species of frogs and salamanders and snakes, they're little, that's fine. But if you want to be big, got to be hot-blooded. Okay, Brontosaurus is big and successful and cold-blooded. That breaks the rule. Yeah. So it was this pattern of historical dominance that really bothered me. How could cold-blooded animals get so big and be so successful for so long and keep our own ancestors down, somehow suppress us? It bothered me. Now, are there physiological things you can look for in the bones to lend confirmation to the idea? Yeah, that that's, what I, that's what I started looking for. One of the first things I found was uh, well, just leg length. If you run around measuring how long lizard legs are, compared to the body size, most lizards and salamanders and other cold-blooded animals have fairly short legs. Now run around in a zoo, measure leg length of antelope or big cats. Look at a crocodile, they have that half push-up kind of walk. Yeah, the posture and leg length is different. Dinosaurs on average were very leggy animals. They have long legs. Brontosaurus has longer legs for its size than an elephant. It's not short-legged like a tortoise. And the construction of the feet, fore and hind, very compact, very strong. Dinosaur feet were for running and walking at a fair speed over dry ground. Mm -hmm. So when you first published the work about dinosaurs being warm-blooded, how did your colleagues react then? It was more harumphing, but it was a more worried harumphing because they were afraid the idea might catch on. It's like the quote from a Victorian woman upon reading Darwin's origin of the species, she said something like, well, I hope it's not true, <laughs> but if it is true, I hope it doesn't become widely known. And I found that sort of attitude from the establishment, with notable exceptions, though. There were some very supportive people, like Jack McIntosh, now retired from Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. And what about what happened 65 million years ago? I mean, sort of the new paradigm is an asteroid hit the Earth, ah, yes. there was a big explosion, it kicked up dust, there were firestorms, the <laughs> dust blocked the sun, without sun, plants died, oh, without it's plants. It was terrible. You know, it goes on and on, acid rain hitting like... I'll tell you why it's bunk. The widely believed and widely publicized cosmic zap theory goes like this. This bolt from the heavens, a meteorite or something, whacks the Earth. And there's physical evidence for this. I mean, we yeah, dig down. Whackings do happen. Oh, yeah. Whackings happen. I mean, we found the crater off the Yucatan. There may well have been a major whacking from the heavens 65 million years ago, roughly at the same time mm -hmm. the dinosaurs went extinct. Yeah, those are the facts. And the theory goes like this. You whack the Earth. You send out a dust cloud, huge dust cloud, which chills the Earth. You have dust in the atmosphere. And you also produce acid rain. And this is going to kill the plants and uh, destroy ponds and lakes. And of course, the dinosaurs will die. Here's the problem. If you whack the Earth right now with a giant meteorite and send up this dust storm and send acid rain into ponds and, s and lakes, you're going to kill a lot of frogs. Thousands of frog species today, most are tropical. Mm -hmm. You dump acid rain into their pond, you freeze their pond, they're dead. They have no adaptation to hibernate. They're dead. If you whack the Earth today, with a meteorite as big as some theorists say hit the earth when the dinosaurs were going extinct, you're gonna kill a lot of snails. So you don't dispute that an asteroid or a comet hit the earth 65 million years ago. What you're saying is that's not the principal agent it's, that caused It dinosaurs. was a cosmic backfire, a loud event that made no effect because the number of frog species that goes extinct when this meteorite hit is zero. The number of pond snails and pond clams that go extinct when this allegedly big meteorite hit is zero. The number of pond turtles and alligators and crocodiles and newts and salamanders 
all of the myriad of slime sucking animals that live in tropical ponds, they all survived. So the meteorite must have been much, much, much smaller than people have thought. So it's 65 million years ago. It's the dinosaurs which die out. Period. And stuff in the oceans too. That's the other problem. The ocean extinctions are not caused by the same event at all. There are a whole bunch of dinosaur extinctions. It's not well known enough. Right. The reason we're digging in this valley is to study the Jurassic extinction, when most, not all, but most big dinosaurs went extinct. Right, and most people have the impression that brontosaurus went to the end, but they died no out about way. What, most, 130 million? Most of the Jurassic cast of characters, brontos, diplodocus, stegosaurs, allosaurs, ceratosaurs, all of that crowd, either went extinct or became real rare at the beginning of the Cretaceous. And then you get a new host Which of dinosaurs. Which is how long ago? The event that wiped out the Jurassic dinosaurs, about 142 million. Okay. 142 million. Then there's another extinction at 100 million in the middle of the Cretaceous. Then there's the final one at 65 million. And then we've been through several extinctions since then. Mm -hmm. 10,000 years ago in this valley, there were two kinds of woolly mammoth. And there were giant ground sloths. And there were saber-toothed cats. And there were cheetahs. And there were giant camels. A lot of giant animals. They're all gone. They went extinct. If you want to know why the dinosaurs went extinct, you've got to study all these extinction events and look for a common modus operandi. It's like tracking down a serial mm -hmm. killer because each one of these extinction events happened the same way. And what do they have the in common? Way. Only big active animals go extinct on the continents, which is less than 1%. Hmm. It's just the big guys. Mm -hmm. Nobody little, no snails, no clams, no frogs. Plants don't go extinct. In the oceans, there may or may not be an extinction. There may be linked, may not. During the Ice Age extinctions, you lost all the mammoths, but nothing happened in the ocean, no extinction. Mm -hmm. During the dinosaur extinction, you lose the dinosaurs, and you lose a lot of clams. But that doesn't necessarily always happen. Land extinctions are very peculiar, and they only affect the pinnacle of your ecological pyramid, just the big guys. Hmm. And a meteorite wouldn't do that. A meteorite wouldn't be a selective so what would mark. have done it? What would have done it 65 million years ago? It's a simple answer. answer. Go to a zoo. No, better yet, go to Wyoming Fish and Game and mm -hmm. say, what are you guys worried about? Number one worry is some yeehaw will start a game ranch and put in Asiatic deer and African antelope. That's what they're worried about. In fact, that's illegal in Wyoming. Why? Because foreign deer bring in foreign diseases, which can wipe out our native Wyoming deer. Mm -hmm. Foreign antelope bring in foreign diseases, which can wipe out our native Wyoming antelope. Talk to a zoo 